The early morning light filled the hospital room, gently enveloping the three women standing guard over the man in the bed. He lay silently, his once muscular body now withered in pain, eaten from the inside out by cancer. A late forties petite brunette cradled the man's hand next to her cheek. Her curly shoulder-length hair framed her pretty, tear-stained face. Sitting beside her was a late twenties version of the woman. On the other side of the bed was a thirty-ish tall attractive blonde who bore many of the same facial features as the man lying in the bed. Lovingly, she carefully wiped her father's now bald head. Their silent vigil was interrupted by a soft knock on the door. A tall blonde man stuck his head in. Sis, is he awake? He whispered to the blonde. Not right now, Tim, replied Angie. He's only awake for short amounts of time. The morphine keeps putting him to sleep, Molly. He said gently, turning to the older brunette. May we come in? She looked up at him, smiled weakly, and nodded. He stepped back and opened the door. A very attractive woman in her early fifties sheepishly entered the room. Her long hair was a heavy mixture of blonde and silver streaks that flowed loosely about her shoulders. Even at her age, she still had a body woman twenty years younger in Vide. Molly softly greeted, Gwen, please come in. Angie stood up and looked over at Molly. Molly smiled reassuringly and nodded. The young blonde turned back to the guest. I guess you can sit here, Mom. Thank you, Angie. What ensued was a human chess match. Each move by one of the human chess pieces caused a move by another piece. Each advancement toward the king resulted in a defensive counter move to protect him. Finally, the room settled when Angie sat on the other side of the bed. For Molly and her daughter Jessica, Angie had moved to a chair in one corner while Tim sat in the other corner chair. Thank you for allowing me to come today, Gwen said softly. When the kids told me Joe was going to spend whatever time was left at home, I had to ask to see him. It was the right thing to do. Molly replied wearily. I talked it over with Joe, and he agreed. He doesn't want any visitors once we get him home later today. So I'm glad you were able to make it here before you released. He softly groaned as his eyes slowly opened. After not having looked into each other's eyes for over a decade, they became locked. Gwen, he croaked softly. I'm here. Joe whispered. Where's Molly? I'm right here, honey, his wife said gently, patting his hand. He smiled weakly, gazing into his wife's soft brown eyes. Looking around the room, he took note of everyone there. We are gathered here today, he said, smirking as he heard several chuckles. Closing his eyes, he sighed deeply, cleared his throat, and stared at his ex-wife. Okay, Gwen, he said weakly. Say what you need to say. I'm sorry if I doze, he added. I can't seem to stay awake. I understand, Joe, Gwen said. I'll keep it brief, but if you fall asleep, please don't worry. Most of what I need to say is for our kids anyway. He nodded, and she took a deep breath. Joe, I just wanted to tell you goodbye. I already said that ten years ago, he responded. Yes, she said with a slight tremor in her voice. I remember, but when I heard you were dying, I knew I still had some things I needed to say to you. Forgive me. She intensely whispered. Please, Joe, tell me you forgive me. They stared at each other silently for a minute before Joe sighed. You're forgiven. Gwen sat back, obviously surprised by his response. Just like that? She questioned. He snorted. No, not just like that. It took years to say that, and mean it. Molly winced in pain and let out a muffled groan, reaching over. He pushed the button on his morphine drip. Within seconds, his breathing deepened, and his face visibly relaxed. Minutes later, he was asleep. I'm sorry, Gwen, Molly said gently. He'll be out for a while. I know it probably wasn't what you hoped it would be. Gwen shook her head. Actually, it was more than I dared hope for. I could only dream of him saying he forgave me. I know I have you to thank for that. No, Molly said gently, shaking her head. I could never talk Joe into doing something he truly doesn't want to do. Oh, I know. He'll do things for me he prefers not to. 
but never something he didn't feel was right. Well, I'm still thankful he found someone like you after I lost his love. You didn't lose his love. Mother, Angie spat. You threw it away. I know, Angie, Gwen replied sadly. And that's something I'll regret for the rest of my life. You have regrets too, don't you? Angie snorted and then sat quietly, her lips pursed tightly, looking as if she'd sucked on a lemon. Sweetheart, we all have regrets. Things we wish we hadn't done or things we hoped would have turned out differently. Some of those things we had no control over, while others we brought upon ourselves. My greatest regret is that I allowed myself to go insane during those months. Don't try to excuse it. Angie snapped. No, I didn't, Gwen replied. Only that my thinking was severely messed up during that time. There were a lot of things happening back then, things I doubt either you or Tim were aware of. I know, neither your father nor I ever told you the details of everything that happened. Joe chose not to do that because he felt I had cheated him, not you, since you were both already out of the house. I never told you about it because, well, because it would have made you hate me even more than you already do. I don't hate you, mother, Angie said coldly. I hate what you did, not you, however. I'll never sit quietly and listen to anyone downplay the magnitude of destruction and pain your actions cost, Tim. Please believe me when I say I never considered the amount of pain my actions would cause. How could you not, Mom? Tim said calmly from his chair, you had to know that cheating would hurt him. You and our family were the world to him. Gwen nodded. You're right. I didn't know what I was doing was wrong, but I ignored the possible consequences. When I did let myself think about it, I immediately knew the danger I'd put my marriage in. Fortunately, that realization didn't come until I was already in the affair. By then, it was far too late. During the divorce, everyone asked me why I'd done such a horrible thing. I wish I had a better explanation than the pathetic excuses I came up with back then. I've had ten years to dissect my actions, and I believe I now have a better idea of what happened. This isn't an excuse, she said, staring coldly at her daughter. Just an explanation of how it happened. Up until now, I've never wanted to admit the reasons because they make me look as selfish and shallow as I was. Simply stated, Several things happened at the same time that presented me with the opportunity to cheat on Joe, and I arrogantly and foolishly walked right into it. Molly said, Gwen, gently, you're a very beautiful woman. I'm sure you had many opportunities to break your marriage vows over all the years you two were married. Molly smiled weakly at her ex-husband's wife. Thank you, and you're right. I had lots of opportunities, but not like this. Joe had started traveling again after he accepted a large contract. I knew he took it to help pay for Angie and Tim's college, and we discussed it, and were in agreement. It was only for six months, but it affected me worse than I'd ever dreamed it would. When he traveled earlier in our marriage, I had the kids there to help me deal with it. With both of them in college, I was by myself. I felt so old and alone. Then at work, a handsome younger man began pursuing me. I knew Douglas was only doing it for physical pleasure, but having a rising corporate star paying attention to you was very flattering. Angie snorted as Tim's look of disappointment was plainly visible on his face. Gwen quickly continued. Like I said, she said calmly as she looked at her children, I was arrogant and selfish. I know it doesn't excuse what I did, but hopefully you'll see how I allowed it to happen. I want you to know it was never anything that your father did or didn't do. It was my fears, and then my ego that opened the door. I never stopped loving him, even during the affair. How can you say that, mother? Angie sneered. You were involved with another man. I know you don't believe it, but it's true. The problem wasn't that I didn't love your father because I did. The problem was that I loved myself more during that time. I put my needs and wants ahead of the family and your father's needs. For four months, I used my unhappiness to justify my actions. When I finally came to my senses, I broke off the affair, but the seeds of destruction had already been planted. I'd hoped I could live with it and spare your father the pain of finding out his wife was unfaithful. 
I knew there was a good chance he would divorce me if he ever found out. Then fate stepped in to make it sooner than I'd hoped. When I broke off the affair with Douglas, neither of us wanted anyone to know about it. He actually had more to lose than I did. He was married to the daughter of one of our board of directors and was our corporation's star project manager. He was on course to be our youngest corporate vice president. So when I ended the affair, I made one stipulation. He was never to have contact with Joe or work on any project with him. My corporation had contracted with your father's company several times in the past, and I couldn't bear the thought of Joe answering to Douglas. Douglas would always have the secret knowledge that he'd been involved with me, and he might have somehow used that against your father. I couldn't take the chance he'd disrespect Joe. It sounds silly, right? After I disrespected your father for those months. Douglas agreed, of course. Things seemed like they were going to be okay if I could just get past the guilt. Then that government contract came along. It was potentially worth millions, and I knew Douglas would head up any GSA project if we wanted it. I also knew Joe's company was going to be deeply involved with it as well. It was after we won the bid that my fears were realized. It was announced that Joe would be heading up the engineering team, an essential element to the project. He would, of course, be answering to the project manager, Douglas. I confronted Douglas and reminded him about our agreement, but he told me business was business and refused to step aside. I don't think he believed I'd go through with my threat, but he was wrong. Gwen paused and took a deep breath, tears streaming down her face, testifying to the pain of the memories. Your father handled my confession like I expected. He sat stoically and listened, asking several clarifying questions. I could see him gathering the information he needed before making a decision. When I saw a tear begin to run down his cheek, I knew it would end badly for us. The next day, he removed himself from the team. I don't know if he was trying to take the high road and protect his company's interests, or if he suspected what would happen when he stepped down. Either way, it couldn't have worked out any better for your father. Since all hell broke loose, he was a key part of that team. So when he tried to step down, it got everyone's attention, including the bigwigs in both our companies. When they started asking questions, their assistants started digging for answers. It didn't take them long to uncover Douglas's affair. That's when the nightmares that had tormented me for the past year became a reality. As I expected, the dollar signs outweighed any clout Douglas had, and he was removed from the project. It worked out well for Joe and his company though the embarrassment of the situation prompted my corporate leadership to offer a larger percentage of the contract's profits to his company, and he ended up getting promoted. Douglas, and I didn't fare nearly as well. Why would you have expected that? Tim commented coldly. I didn't, Gwen said softly. Not even back then. The shame of her confession was etched on her usually pretty face. It was obvious she had carried this burden for many years. What I could never have imagined was how bad things were about to get. Douglas and I both tried to find other employment only to discover we were effectively blacklisted. Apparently, Douglas's father-in-law took his family's and daughter's embarrassment very personally. Douglas ended up getting assigned to every unpleasant project in some of the worst third-world countries. After spending several years jumping from one difficult place to the next, he finally gave up. He gave his wife a divorce and crawled away with nothing. Last I heard, he was selling insurance in Detroit. Since he was a couple levels above me on the corporate ladder, he was still considered one of my supervisors. I know the company feared a lawsuit, so they promoted me right back into an office that never sees the light of day. I guess I shouldn't complain. The money is decent, but my career is essentially over. She paused and looked into the eyes of each individual in the room as if trying to assess how they were receiving her confession. Jessica had a pinched look on her face, clearly annoyed to hear how her stepfather had been unfaithful. Molly looked concerned and guarded. It was easy to tell she already knew most of this. It was Tim and Angie's looks that caused her to falter. The hurt and disappointment in their eyes seemed more than she could bear. Slowly, she gathered herself and continued. If I thought things were bad at work, then what was happening at home was a living hell. My marriage was collapsing, 
and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Joe sat down and talked to me a few times after he filed for divorce. I apologized until I was blue in the face. I told him that none of it was his fault, that it was me who destroyed our wonderful marriage. He said it couldn't have been too wonderful if it wasn't enough to keep me out of Douglas's bed. That hurt. I understood why he was bitter and why he'd said it, but it still hurt. Joe then asked me why I cheated. My answer was just a string of excuses. After that, he broke off all communication with me. At first, I was angry and frustrated. I was mad at myself for bringing all this down on us, and I was frustrated with Joe for not trying to help save the marriage. Oh, please, mother, Angie scolded. If daddy had cheated on you, would you have forgiven him and fought for the marriage? Gwen slowly shook her head and smiled sadly. We both know the answer to that, sweetheart. I would have been much more vindictive and would have tried to inflict much more pain than your father did. Angie responded, I said I was disappointed, not that I didn't understand why he was reacting that way. I didn't really blame him. I was angry because I saw our twenty-year marriage circling the drain. I knew I'd pulled the plug, but I was infuriated that I couldn't stop it. Only Joe had the ability to save it, and he chose not to. You know, if he'd really wanted to make my life a living hell, he would have. Taking me back, there were several small gasps. You've always had a way with words, haven't you, mother? That's not what I meant. And you know it, Angie. I said with tears beginning to fill my eyes. What did you mean, Mom? Tim asked gently from behind her. I would have done anything to show your father how sorry I was for destroying us. I would have degraded myself in ways that would have shamed an old man if he could have somehow found a way to love me again. But I knew the night I told him about my affair that it would never happen. Even through my tears, I could see how deeply I'd wounded the man I claimed to love. I swear I saw his love for me die right there in front of me. Our marriage was over right then. I saw it in his eyes. He had to move on. Mom, Tim said softly, we all did. Yes, I know, I said. I also know I'm, I'm still having some difficulties doing that. You kids have been a great help to me in those areas. Oh, I know you were angry with me at first, Angie added softly. No, Furious was more like it. You had every right to be, but you didn't abandon me. I'm not sure I could have survived that. I'm thankful Joe didn't turn you against me. Dad would have never done that. No, Gwen said, shaking her head. No, that wouldn't have been him. She smiled sadly at her son, and then turned towards Molly. Did you know I prayed that somehow, some way, I could get my marriage back? I begged and pleaded with God to somehow change Joe's heart and mind and give me another chance. I know I didn't deserve it, but it's what I wanted. I held on to that dream for over a year. Then Angie told me he'd started seriously dating you, Molly. That was when I knew my prayers weren't going to be answered. It wasn't until after you and Joe got married that I seriously tried to get on with my life. I started dating again, and that was when I found out just what kind of marriage I had before I destroyed it. We had something very good, but I'd forgotten how special it was. I was reminded when I started dating again. Boy, was I reminded. I dated quite a bit, but it never failed. I'd start comparing them to Joe, and it wouldn't last too long. After that, there's a special kind of intimacy between lovers that only comes with time. Only someone who's been close to you many times before knows when you want to be taken forcefully with raw passion or when just gentle caresses and a soft kiss will send you over the edge. You can't imagine how humbling it is to realize that just because you crave your lover to know those things, it won't happen. It's not because he's not willing, but because he doesn't know you and your body well enough to know what brings you the most satisfaction at that moment. My nightmare was realizing I was the reason those things were gone because of my actions, Every romantic relationship I now had was forced to start from scratch. Oh, there were a few relationships that seemed promising over the years. Two of them even ended in proposals. But I turned both of them down. Why? Molly asked, concern written on her face. Why didn't you accept? 
Gwen sighed deeply. Well, that's a bit complicated. One reason was I was still in love with my ex-husband. Mother, Angie scolded again. No, Gwen snapped back at her. You don't get to tell me what I'm already very much aware of. You can't say anything I haven't heard or told myself a million times. None of you get to tell me what I feel. I love your father, and I always will. I know it doesn't change anything, but I'll always feel guilty for what I did. I'm learning to try to live with those feelings and move on. In some ways, I have, but in other areas, I'm still stuck. Angie, sweetheart, Molly said softly, trying to calm the situation. It's okay. I'm not jealous. I know how much your daddy loves me. Gwen flinched slightly. I know that as well, Molly continued. That's why I felt like I could make that statement. I know you will forever have his love. I admit I'm jealous of that, but it was my own doing. Please, I don't want anyone to think my feelings for Joe were the reason I turned down those marriage proposals. It's much deeper than that. Just like everyone in here, I question if I really loved my husband like I said I did. How could I act that way? I wish I had an answer I could live with. So I compared my love for my would-be suitors to my love for Joe, and since my feelings for each of them weren't as strong as my feelings for him, I had a problem. If I couldn't stay faithful to Joe, how could I promise either of them my fidelity? I cared enough about them to turn each one down at that time. It was the right thing to do since it wouldn't have been fair to them. I'm sorry, Molly gently spoke. I'm sorry you're going through that. Gwen smiled sadly. It's easy to see why Joe fell in love with you, Molly. She said sadly, you're beautiful on both the inside and outside. Thank you, Molly said, her face pinched with concern. But please don't make me out to be some kind of saint. I have my own regrets, especially related to my first marriage, but one in particular is related to Joe. Mom, Jessica alarmed questioned, no, it wasn't something terrible, but it is something I'm ashamed of. Since Gwen had been so brave in talking about her regrets, I'll try to follow suit. It happened a few months after Joe, when I had started dating. Our dates had been quite warm and affectionate, but we hadn't been intimate. I knew it had been a while for him while both of us were dealing with the romantic tension between us, which was complicating everything. Then I overheard a phone call. It was obvious Maggie was starting to get uncomfortable. Taking a deep breath, she continued, I heard Joe talking to someone. At first, I thought it was you, Angie, but now I realize I don't know who it was. Whoever it was, Joe was talking about possibly reconciling with Gwen. I know I love Joe, but I was still so scared after the disaster of my first marriage. Even though my first husband had left us nine years earlier, I had never let a man as close as I had Joe. I knew he was a good man, and he would be a good father and a great husband, so I decided that he was mine. That week, I shamelessly threw myself at him in an attempt to claim him and keep him solely focused on me. In short, I showed him how I felt. Mom, Jessica said smiling, I seriously doubt it took much to get Dad's attention. Every time I saw you two, you were always touching each other. Seriously, Molly agreed. Daddy could never seem to keep his hands off of you. Your father has always been very affectionate. Jessica snorted while Angie and Tim smiled. Affectionate is another word for eager. Jessica grinned. Jess. Molly scolded, and the three adult kids laughed. Gwen shifted uncomfortably in her seat, her mother Jessica said, still smiling. I can't see why you regret showing the man you love how much you desired him, sweetheart. I don't regret that, Molly replied. What I regret is that it took the fear of losing him to bring me to that point. I also wonder what would have happened if I hadn't done that. Would Joe have waited on me? Would he have gone back to Gwen? Whatever would have happened, I would have hoped he was happy. I know I've been more than satisfied with the life we shared, Molly continued. Tim, I said gently, Dad always says you and just saved him. Molly nodded and softly laughed. I know he does. She said warmly, but the truth is, he saved us as well. After my ex took off, I had some real trust issues. 
I dated on and off again for almost ten years, but those issues were always in the way. I had trouble believing any man would want me for something other than just intimate connections. Then Joe shattered those misconceptions. Gwen chuckled as she looked at her grinning stepsister. What? Molly asked, confusion clearly written on her face. Sure, Dad wanted you for more than just intimate connections, Gwen said. Of course he did, honey. Oh my, Tim, Angie, and Jess laughed as they watched Molly's face turn bright red again. Jessica, Patterson, you behave, Molly replied, fighting back a shy smile. Your father's love has been so much more than just that. He's a good man and a great father. Even when he first got sick, he was still looking out for us. I couldn't have prayed for a better, more loving husband. He's made these last eight years happier than I'd ever thought possible. I never realized Joe ever seriously considered reconciling with me, Gwen stated softly. I wonder who he would have been talking to about something so personal. Well, since this is apparently our family confession day, Angie stated sarcastically, that was probably me. Daddy and I had several conversations concerning that. I didn't realize you were so involved with these decisions back then, Molly said gently. Angie sighed, looked over at Jess, then back to Molly. More than you can probably guess. Well, Angie said calmly, I knew Daddy was at a crossroads back then, whether to live in the past or to move forward. He told me he was falling in love with you, and if he didn't break it off, he'd probably ask you to marry him. He said he still had feelings for Mom, though he told me you can't be married to someone for that long and not still have some feelings for them. I asked him about those feelings. He told me where once they had been almost purely love, now they were a mixture of love and hate, anger and bitterness, weariness and despair. He was struggling with whether to go back and try to work out those feelings or to start fresh. Naturally, since I'd been trying to set him up with Molly, I pushed him that way. You tried to set him up with other women, Gwen said sadly. I didn't realize you hated me that much, Mom. Like I said, I don't hate you, but this wasn't about you. This was about Daddy. I saw what your affair did to him. It almost killed him. On the outside, he might have appeared strong and calm, but on the inside, he was bleeding to death. I stayed with him that summer after you told him about your affair. It was a month after your confession, and all hell was breaking loose. I can't tell you the number of nights I'd go up to his room to check on him and hear him crying. He wouldn't cry in front of me, but when he was alone in his room, he'd let the pain out. I'd sit quietly outside his door in the hallway and cry with him. Tears filled Gwen's eyes as she slowly shook her head. I never knew, she said quietly. I knew I'd hurt him, but I never saw any signs of his pain other than his angry outbursts. That's because he never wanted you to see it, Angie said. He didn't want you to have the satisfaction of knowing how badly you'd wounded him. I never meant to hurt him like that, Gwen. I was selfish and totally focused on what I wanted and needed, but I didn't maliciously try to hurt your father. Whether you did it intentionally or just through your mistakes isn't really important, Mom. The fact was you did it. So when he was faced with the choice of going back to a wife who had hurt him in so many ways, or starting again with a woman who loved him and would never hurt him, I pushed for the latter. We all know it would have taken months or years of working through the trust issues just to get to a level where he could begin to relax and be happy again with you, Mom. So, hell yes, I pushed for him to start fresh with Molly. I do regret manipulating him a little, and I even sort of feel bad that I had a hand in making sure you two didn't get back together. But to be honest, Mother, this wasn't about you anymore. This was about my father's happiness, and I believed, and still believe, that he was happier with Molly than going back and trying to wade through all the rebuilding of his marriage with you. Angie, Molly interjected gently, I'm torn slightly between scolding you and hugging you and thanking you. Well, Jessica interjected. She didn't do it quite alone. I've got my own confession to add to all this. Jess, Molly asked in surprise. Mom, you know I met Angie in college. 
She was an upperclassman who was tutoring me my first year. We became friends, and it didn't hurt that she had a cute younger brother a couple of years older than me. She looked at Tim and sadly smiled before turning back to her mother. I was still living at home, and Angie came over several times. I could tell she was watching you very closely. When I confronted her about it, she shared her thoughts that you and her father would be perfect together. I was going to move on the campus the next year and was worried about you being left alone. I guess that was when we conspired to find a way to get you two together to see if there was any chemistry. I'd gone out with Tim a couple of times before. Angie invited me to stay the weekend at their house when I first met Dad. I mean Joe. I fell in love with him immediately. Angie snorted a laugh. She fell for him almost as quickly as you did. Molly, Angie, and Jessica snickered. I fell for him at least a full week faster than my mother did. It took her that long to pull her head out of her. Jess interrupted playfully, sticking her tongue out at her mother and smiling innocently. Anyway, since I was hooked, we began planning how to get you two together. Angie came up with the idea of inviting both of you to meet for a weekend visit. I'm sorry to say the story we used to cover our plan was that I was really into Tim and wanted my mom to meet him. Jessica turned to Tim. I'm sorry, Tim. I guess I never really apologized to you for giving you the impression I was more serious about us than I really was. You were a great guy when we were dating, and I was obviously very attracted to you, but you weren't in love with me. I know, Tim interjected. I couldn't figure out what was going on. At first, I knew I cared more for you than you did for me, but that first visit to my home was a surprise. Then, after seeing you with my dad, I was even more confused. I won't tell you that a guy's ego doesn't take a hit when his girlfriend falls more for his father than she does for him. But after your next visit with your mom, I finally understood. Up until then, I was afraid I'd fallen for a girl with some serious daddy issues. Well, Jessica laughed. I guess in a way, I did. I don't know too many 19-year-olds who change their last name when their mother remarries. Even though we never lived under the same roof, he's been more of a father than any other man ever has. Gwen grinned after seeing your mom and watching Dad's reaction to her and you. It was very obvious I'd forgotten how long it had been since I'd seen him smile and laugh like that. The silent room was filled with both reminiscent smiles and troublesome regrets. Well, Tim, he said quietly, since everyone else has confessed to some deep, dark secrets, I guess it's my turn. With all eyes turned to him, Tim cleared his throat. I just wanted to let you all know that you'll probably read something in the papers next week that might upset you. Yes, it's true. I'm a lost Kardashian sister, and I've recently become engaged to Bruce. I mean Caitlyn Murray Jenner. Angie snorted, and the room filled with sporadic laughter, a stark contrast to the earlier mood. Just like his father, both Gwen and Molly said simultaneously, the two women stared at each other in surprise before Tim interjected again. Thank you, he said, smiling warmly. I can't think of a better compliment. The room slowly drained of the small chuckles and settled into an uneasy quietness before Gwen gracefully stood up. Molly, she said with a small sad smile, thank you again for allowing me to come here today. I'm still trying to move on. This meeting was a big step for me. Thank you for letting it happen. You're very welcome, Gwen. Molly replied, and I hope you are able to move on and have a wonderful life. This was mainly Joe's decision, even though we both felt some good could come from this. If he hadn't, I wouldn't have agreed to it. I won't let anyone hurt my husband. I wish, Gwen whispered, I wish I'd been that passionately loyal. She looked over at her son, Tim, would you drive me to my hotel? He nodded and gathered his things. Gwen looked back at the fragile man sleeping in the bed. Molly, please tell Joe's in my prayers. So are you and Jessica. I will, Molly said, and thank you. Gwen turned and slowly walked out of the room. Once safely on the other side of the door, the tears began to stream down her face, and she quietly sobbed. She realized that was the last time she'd see the love of her life alive. Two and a half weeks later, Joseph Randall Patterson, 
age 53, passed away. He died in his sleep while at home, surrounded by his loving family. The graveside service had been bittersweet. Molly sat between Jessica in the front row, much to the surprise of some in attendance. Gwen also sat in the front row between Angie and Tim. After the service, friends and family gave their condolences, and then left, heading for the family reception. Now, all three adult children surrounded Molly as they stood by the limos. Molly Angie said in a gentle voice, I want to thank you again. I never thought I'd see Daddy smile again after the divorce, but you and Jessica brought that back into his life. You reminded him he could love again, and there was no doubt he loved you both. Molly reached over and gently took her hand. Never forget how much he loved you and Tim. He was always so proud of you too. We know, Tim said, smiling sadly. But divorces make it hard on everyone. Even though Angie and I had already left home, their divorce was hard on us. We wanted to be there for Dad because he was so hurt and angry. But we weren't able to be there every day. We're so, so grateful he found you, Angie. And I also want to thank you for how you treated Mom these last few weeks. Angie added softly, You've allowed her to say goodbye to Dad and be a part of celebrating his life today. Not a lot of people would have allowed an ex to do that. Oh, honey, Molly said, your dad and I knew it was important to Angie, and you as well as your mother. It means more than you know. When daddy fell in love with you, he was able to move on with his life. Angie continued, but mom never really has. Hopefully, you and daddy allowing her to say goodbye will help, Molly replied. Tim, he said, not only did you give my daddy a new life, but you might have allowed my mom to do the same. Your father and I love you both, Molly started to say, I love you both, but her voice cracked. She tried to stop a sob as she reached out to lean against the limo. Tears began to stream down her face. I'm going to miss him so much, she sobbed. Tim stepped forward and wrapped his arms around her as she buried her face in his chest and wept. The two younger women held each other as they watched her grieve the loss of her love. Slowly, she regained her composure, and the group solemnly turned their attention to a solitary woman kneeling beside the gravestone, oblivious to her audience. The woman quietly sobbed as she gently stroked the cold marble headstone and whispered the things of her heart to the man she once called husband. Angie and Tim silently walked over and stood on either side of their mother. Mama, Angie whispered gently, it's time to go. Listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Story 2 This is a story about human weaknesses and the strength of decision-making, about how forgiveness and letting go can help us move forward. Rob faces a painful divorce, deceit, and disappointment, but ultimately finds a new path to happiness. I have learned from my own experience that you need to check everything carefully before getting married. This is an extremely important moment, and if you do not take into account all the nuances, then in the future, it will all become clear. I wasn't a fool. I was taken advantage of and led by the nose, and it was done by the people I trusted the most and thought I could rely on at any moment. I instructed the two gentlemen carrying the dresser to place it against the wall. Returning to the task of hanging pictures, I was approached by Tom, who had two suitcases in hand. Where do you want them? He asked. I want them on the floor in front of the bed, and when you bring in the items on hangers, just place them in the closet. Once the pictures were up, I arranged the suitcases on the bed and proceeded to unload them into the dresser drawers. The remaining boxes were brought in by Tom and two others, Mike and Phil. I directed them to store the contents in the closet. Phil handed me a travel case, remarking, This is the last of it. Taking the case, I informed them that I would meet them at Murphy's Tavern in half an hour. After unpacking the case and organizing its contents on top of the dresser, I stepped back to survey the room, adjusting a few items for a more uniform appearance. I assessed the overall arrangement and was satisfied with the result. I left the room and headed to Murphy's to join my friends. I was enjoying my second beer when my cell phone interrupted the moment. 
Glancing at the screen, I noticed the call was from my wife. Opening the phone, I greeted her with a casual, Hello. Rob, I'm at the house and I can't get in. The garage door opener isn't working. And none of my keys fit the locks, she said. Not surprising, Maggie, since you don't live there anymore. Of course I live here. Where are you, Maggie? I'm at the house. I mean, where are you standing right now? On the front porch. Look around you. You should see a man approaching. His instructions were to wait until he saw you, take out your cell phone, and make a call before telling you what is going on. There is a man coming up the walk right now. He will answer all of your questions. Goodbye. Five minutes later, my cell phone rang again, and once more it was my wife. Rob, what the hell is this? Nonsense about divorce, I exclaimed. No nonsense, Maggie. I just decided that it was time to end things with a cheating wife. Don't be stupid, Rob. I have never cheated on you. I'm not being stupid, Maggie. What I am is no longer stupid and blind. Don't bother calling me again. You've been served, and the papers have my attorney's name and phone number. Any communication between us from now on will have to go through him. And by the way, I moved all of your things out of the house and into your lover's place. Goodbye, Maggie. I disconnected, signaled the waitress, and ordered us another round. It all began with a call from Tom, who suggested meeting up for a drink after work. Tom had been my closest companion since the first day of seventh grade, and our bond was immediate and unwavering throughout high school. Following graduation, I pursued a degree in business management at college while Tom enlisted in the Navy. After completing his service, we reconnected, meeting once or twice a week and hosting monthly cookouts in either his backyard or mine. Our rendezvous took place at Murphy's Tavern. Finding Tom already seated at a back table, I waved at Sally as I passed the bar, and she promptly opened a course, handing it to Sherry to deliver to me. Seated across from Tom, I inquired, What's going on? It's not good, buddy, and I won't come off looking great here, so I need to provide some context. Remember our high school days. If a girl didn't engage on the first date, there wouldn't be a second one. Our philosophy was if she did on the first date, one wasn't enough. And four was too many. Yeah, but that's ancient history. Yes and no. It convinced me that intimacy was just entertainment, fun, not to be taken seriously. You know. And I know you know that Barb and I are swingers. We keep it discreet unless someone approaches us about it and only swing with out-of-town groups. Barb shares my view. Intimacy is meant to be enjoyed without love and devotion. I love Bard to death, and everyone knows it. It doesn't bother me to see her enjoying herself with someone else because I know she'll be going home with me, committed to spoiling me rotten. What does that have to do with me? I'm working on it. After leaving the Navy, our approach to relationships changed. I had already met Barb and believed she was the one for me while you were dating Maggie. Additionally, we had matured a bit with age. I married Bard, and you married Maggie, and the following six years passed happily until two weeks ago. What happened two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, you sat at this very table after a few beers. You shared that you felt something was wrong in your marriage. You even mentioned, and I quote, If I didn't know better, I would say Maggie is cheating on me. Remember that? Yeah, I do. Well, Rob, that's what brings me here today. Maggie is cheating on you. You've got to be kidding. I'm not. Maggie has been cheating on you. Are you serious? As serious as death. How long have you known? Answering that question straightforwardly is tough. Come on, Tom. You brought it up. So spill it. Okay, I've known for two weeks. She has been cheating on you since before you got married. Have you been drinking all day? Of course not. Why would you even ask that? What you said makes absolutely no sense. You've only known for two weeks, but you claimed she was cheating before we got married. We got married over six years ago. Tom, I was aware of her activity since before your marriage, but it wasn't until our conversation two weeks ago that I realized it constituted cheating. 
This is the part where my image takes a hit. Given our past similarities, I assumed you shared my perspective on intimacy, that it was enjoyable, entertaining, and not necessarily tied to love or devotion. I understood that you and Barb weren't like me, but I recognize that everyone has their own preferences. Some men enjoy watching their wives with other men, while others like the idea of their wives going out and then sharing the details afterward. Some find excitement in having a more adventurous spouse, and there are those who, to maintain harmony in the family, allow their wives some freedom. Then there are men who don't mind what their wives do as long as they return home. I assumed you fell into one of these categories. Why would you assume that? Why wouldn't I? Maggie has been engaging in this behavior for over six years, at least twice a week. How could you not be aware? I mean, come on, Rob. Concealing infidelity for six or maybe eight months is one thing, but for six years, I assumed you must have known, just as you knew about Barb and me without ever mentioning it. I never brought up what I thought was happening between you and Maggie. Now, am I correct in thinking that, considering how well you know me, you might have assumed the same about me? I pondered his words for a moment before responding. No, not at all. If it's been happening for as long as you suggest, I can understand the rationale behind your thoughts. What baffles me is that it could have persisted for so long without me having a clue. It's only in the past month or so that I started sensing that something was amiss. So I suppose the crucial questions now are who, when, and where. I attentively absorbed Tom's account of everything he knew for certain, his suspicions, and the information he'd gathered from others. When he finished, I sat there profoundly shaking. What's your plan? Tom inquired. I'll gather evidence and then expose that deceitful person. I replied. While driving home, I reflected on the day I first encountered Maggie. My brother Jerry and his wife Christina had invited me to a Sunday barbecue. Upon entering their home, Christina immediately grabbed my arm and insisted on introducing me to someone. This wasn't the first time Christy had attempted to play matchmaker. Since my breakup with Marcia, who had been my girlfriend for three years, until she casually informed me of a date with another guy, Chrissy had persistently set me up with six other candidates. Marcia's revelation had come at an unfortunate moment as I had intended to propose to her that very night. After her announcement, I calmly said, I hope you have a nice time, and proceeded to open the ring box. I glanced at the ring and declared, I guess I'll return this tomorrow. I got up, walked away from her tearful protests, and ignored her constant calls for the next two weeks until she eventually gave up. Now, there was Christy attempting to arrange another encounter with a perfect match, despite my repeated requests for her to stop. She persisted, oblivious to the fact that I wasn't ready for a new relationship. I gently pulled my arm away from Christina's grip and asserted, No, Christina, not this time. Before making my way to find some beer, the gathering included about two dozen people, and I was familiar with at least half of them. As I circulated and engaged in conversations, I discreetly observed the women present, trying to deduce which one Christina had in mind for me. Despite Christina's assumption that there was a specific type I'd be interested in, all seven previous attempts had introduced me to individuals similar to one another and not suitable as replacements for Marcia. I scanned the crowd but couldn't identify anyone who fit the perceived type. However, I did come across a stunning woman with dark hair that quickened my heartbeat. She was surrounded by a group of guys, one of whom was likely her husband, fiancé, or boyfriend. It seemed impossible that she wasn't already spoken for, but I figured there's no harm in trying. Placing my empty beer bottle on a table, I approached the captivating woman who seemed to be the center of attention. I hope you don't mind the interruption, but Christina asked me to come over and find you. And who might you be? I'm Rob. Christina is my sister-in-law. Well, we shouldn't keep her waiting. Lead the way. I noticed she had been drinking white wine, so I guided her to the makeshift bar and offered to refill her glass. I thought we were going to meet Christina. No, what I meant was that Christina sent me to find you. Could you explain that to me? When I arrived, 
Christina mentioned that there was someone here she wanted me to meet. Her exact words were, She's just perfect for you, Rob. Unfortunately, she got caught up with someone else before introducing me to this perfect lady. So, I wandered around until I found you. She cast a discerning gaze my way and then remarked, And you immediately recognized that I was the perfect match for you. I could tell even from across the room. Just then, Kristin approached us. Oh, good. You found each other, Maggie. This is Rob. Rob, meet Maggie O'Neill. Maggie and I burst into laughter, and Chrissy gave us a puzzled look. What? What did I say? Why are you laughing? Still chuckling, I replied, I forgive you, Chrissy. I think this time you got it right. This time, Maggie inquired, It's a long story, and I'll share it all on our first date, which I hope will be tomorrow. It was, and it marked the beginning of a courtship that concluded six months later, when Maggie and I exchanged vows in front of a municipal judge with Christina and my brother Jerry as witnesses. Summoning all my self-restraint, I managed to behave normally. Upon arriving home, Maggie welcomed me with a kiss, casually mentioning that dinner would be ready in twenty minutes. Retrieving a beer from the fridge, I headed to the family room, turned on the TV, and tuned into Fox News. As I endured the mindless chatter of pundits discussing trivial matters, I couldn't help but contemplate how Maggie could confess her love for me daily while engaging in a clandestine affair behind my back. What baffled me even more was that this deception had been going on for over six years, a period that extended back to our dating days. Tom had disclosed the details. Tuesdays, Thursdays, some Saturdays, and especially during my business trips. Tuesdays were supposedly dedicated to card night with her college girlfriends, the sorority sisters she remained close with. Thursdays involved her participation in a book club at the library. So after our dinner, she would kiss me goodbye, urging me not to wait up, only to head out and engage in more than just bridge. Now aware that thirty minutes after kissing me, she would be in a compromising position with her various companions. Yes, companions, not just one. After receiving my customary kiss, I immediately turned to the Internet. It took me less than five minutes to find what I needed. A credit card number and a few key clicks would ensure delivery to my office within three working days. Consulting my watch, I realized I still had time to make it to Radio Shack before closing. By the time Maggie returned from her supposed bridge night, our house phone was tapped, and I was in bed fighting sleep. Even though we had previously been intimate after her car nights, I now understood that on those occasions, I was not her first encounter of the evening. While I continued to engage in intimacy with Maggie on some nights to avoid suspicion, I vowed never to let myself be someone's second or third choice again. In the mornings, I typically left for work before Maggie and I only almost always arrived home after she did, which left me with little opportunity to check the phone tap until Thursday evening when Maggie left the house for her supposed book club meeting. On Wednesday morning, Maggie had a conversation with her mother for about five minutes. Hi, everything okay? I'm fine. You didn't seem like yourself last night. I guess I'm just a bit worried about Rob. He's acting a bit strange. Do you think he knows or suspects something? I don't know. No, it's just a feeling I have. I don't have any solid evidence, just a hunch. Do you want to cancel tomorrow night? No, because if he's suspicious, I'm afraid it would make him curious why, after years of going, you suddenly stopped. I think we have to keep it business as usual. Both of you need to stay vigilant and ensure that nothing gives us away. I'll let him know we don't want the secret getting out there. There was only one call on Thursday. Hi. Hi yourself. Are we still on for tonight? Wouldn't miss it. Love you. Love you too, baby. See you in an hour. Once again, I pretended to be asleep when Maggie came home, and it took all I had not to flinch when she cuddled up next to me on the bed. On Friday, my package was delivered, and upon opening it, I familiarized myself with the instructions. It turned out to be a wireless mini-camera cleverly disguised as a book with motion activation and the ability to transmit signals to a receiver located up to 300 feet away. 
Tom informed me that my wife and her companions occasionally used our house when I was away on business, possibly so that Maggie could be home if I called. My plan was to strategically place the disguised camera during my next trip out of town, while putting the device into the trunk of my car. My thoughts lingered on the phone call from Tuesday. I realized I needed to address Maggie's concerns and ensure she moved past the uneasy feeling she had. There was only one way to do it. When I got home, Maggie was in the kitchen making dinner. Sneaking up behind her, I hugged her gently. Turn off the stove. I'll start with dessert tonight. Is this dessert going to be filled with cream? She teased. I wouldn't be surprised at all. I replied. She turned the stove knobs to the off position, and I lifted her, carrying her to the bedroom. I made sure to repeat the gesture on Saturday morning and Sunday night, hoping it would alleviate any lingering uneasiness. On Monday, I informed Maggie that I'd be heading to San Diego for four days the following week. Tuesday, I took the plunge and stayed up to be with her, engaging in a physical encounter, not lovemaking, just physical intimacy before we fell asleep. Subsequently, Maggie's phone conversations no longer hinted at her suspicion of my peculiar behavior. Come Friday, I eavesdropped on a recorded conversation, discovering Maggie plans to visit her companions before a regular hairdresser appointment. The content of the conversation confirmed my expectations. Will we be arriving at your place next week while he's away? Absolutely. You know I have to be around when Rob makes his nightly check-in call. I'm looking forward to next week. No need to rush, no frantic race to get you home. I cherish the moments when we can spend the entire night together. I feel the same way, baby. I have to, she continued. I need to prepare dinner for my husband. We engaged in physical intimacy on Friday night, Sunday afternoon, and again on Monday morning before I left for my trip. As I bid Maggie farewell, I was mindful that if the book camera functioned as promised and captured what I anticipated, Maggie and I would no longer be sharing a home. A week later, the camera fulfilled its purpose, but it failed to capture both of Maggie's companions. Initially, this puzzled me as I had anticipated having footage of both individuals. However, I dismissed the concern since I had gathered more than enough material for my intended use. Over the weekend, I made an effort to behave normally around Maggie. On Saturday, I met with Tom for a beer, and we finalized our plans for Monday at 10 o'clock. That day, well after Maggie had left for work, Tom, Phil, Mike, and I convened at my house to relocate all of Maggie's belongings by 11 o'clock. The locksmith had arrived, changing all the locks and programming the garage door opener. In the preceding week, I consulted with an attorney to initiate the divorce paperwork, but we delayed serving the papers until I had obtained the visual proof I sought. Monday morning, I contacted the attorney and instructed him to proceed with serving the papers. Phil and Mike had left, leaving only Tom and Nee at Murphy's. Ready or not, it's showtime. Tom spoke up. Suddenly, just then, my brother Jerry approached us with intense anger. You scoundrel. What's the idea of suing Christina and me for alienation of affections? Are you out of your mind? No, but you must have thought you could get away with it forever. You're out of your mind. If you get out of here, Jerry, while you still can, under your own power. Don't threaten me, you little. Jerry was 63, and I was only 5'11", so I was little compared to him. I stood up and hit him landing a punch right on the chin. He went pale in the eye and started to stagger. I hit him twice more, and he fell to the floor. I had already warned Gus behind the bar about the potential altercation, and he just kept drying glasses. Looking down at Jerry, I kicked him in the groin. As I was about to kick him again, Tom pulled me back. Enough, bud. I think he understands how you feel. I don't know if he has the courage to charge you with assault, but let's not make it any worse than it is. Jerry struggled to get up, and I added, Mom and Dad are going to be so proud of you. You wouldn't have the courage. I have plans to dine with them on Wednesday night, and they're likely to inquire about Maggie's absence. Care to speculate what my response will be? Oh, 
And by the way, I utilized the key you entrusted me with during your vacation to access your home. I relocated all of Maggie's belongings to your spare bedroom, so now she can stay there full-time instead of just on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I turned to Tom and suggested, let's leave this place. I waved at Gus, and he reciprocated before we departed. When I arrived home, Maggie's car was already in the driveway, and she sat inside, waiting for me. After pressing the garage door opener button, I maneuvered Maggie to enter the garage and closed the door behind me. Despite her attempt to enter before it shut, Maggie didn't make it in time. Hoping she would eventually leave but knowing she wouldn't, I proceeded into the house. The doorbell began to ring incessantly, and anticipating that it would persist until I answered, I decided to face it head-on. Having foreseen this situation, I had already secured the front and back screen doors and the patio after the locksmith's visit. Maggie attempted to pull the screen door open, but it remained firmly shut. Let me in, Rob, Maggie pleaded. There's nothing for you here. All your belongings have been relocated to Jerry and Christina's place. You now reside in their spare bedroom, saving the travel time you used to spend on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I informed her, we need to talk, Rob. She insisted, no, we don't. The time for that conversation should have been the day I proposed. What should have happened then is you saying, oh God, Rob, I don't know. I have long-term companions. I don't want to give up. If you can see your way clear to share me with them, of course, I'll marry you. I would have declined, and we could have avoided what we're going through now. I replied, I need to explain, Rob. She persisted. Probably I interrupted, but while you feel the need to explain, I don't feel the need to listen. All communication will be through my attorney from now on. With that, I closed the door in her face. Maggie pounded on the door for another 15 or 20 minutes, but I simply turned up the TV volume and ignored her. The following day took a turn for the worse. After a discouraging start, as I prepared my morning coffee, the phone interrupted my routine. It was Jerry. Rob, we need to have a conversation. You've misunderstood everything. It's not what you think, and I need a chance to explain. Jerry pleaded. Those were the exact words Maggie used last night, and I'll tell you what I told her. You might want to clarify, but I have no interest in hearing it. Stay out of my life, Jerry. No calls, no visits, no emails or letters. As far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me, and I don't want to see you or hear your voice again. I retorted before hanging up. Still fuming from the call, the phone rang once more, and this time it was my mother. Don't forget you're coming over for dinner tomorrow night. Aunt Grace is in town, and I'm hosting a family dinner. My mother reminded me, will Jerry and Christina be there? I inquired, of course. Then I'll have to decline. Why in the world would you say that? Jerry and Christina are no longer part of my life. If you want to know why, ask them about their six-year affair with Maggie, I explained. Oh my God, Rob, you can't be serious. My mother gasped. Unfortunately, I am six years, but you've only been married for six years. It seems it started even before Maggie and I got married. I clarified, baby, I'm so sorry. Give my love to Aunt Grace and come up with an excuse for why I can't make it. We'll talk later. My mother said before hanging up, it pained me to put my mom in a position where she had to navigate family events without me and Jerry in the same space, but I knew I had to explain sooner or later. I opted for sooner, as the sooner she knew, the sooner she could confront Jerry. After ending my conversation with my mother, I began inspecting the house and compiling a list of tasks to enhance its market appeal. I harbored no illusions about keeping the house. Living in a state where no-fault divorce was the norm meant selling the house and dividing the proceeds. Moreover, the house was excessively spacious for a single person, as we had initially purchased it with plans for a future family. Our intention was to start having children at 30, allowing us freedom to travel and pursue activities that would become challenging with kids. In hindsight, I was relieved we had delayed, 
as subjecting children to a divorce is never ideal. While contemplating the backyard on the patio, I heard a voice behind me. Afternoon, Rob. Christina greeted, what do you want to talk about? I asked coldly, you won't talk to Maggie or Jerry, so I thought I'd try at least. I don't think you'll hit me like you did Jerry, she said cautiously. No need to talk, Christina. You don't have anything that I either want or need to hear. Since when have I been Christina? It has always been Chrissy or Chris. That was before I found out about you stabbing me in the back for the last six years, I retorted. Don't try to charm me, Christina. I wired the house before my last out-of-town trip. I have it all on DVD. Christina, so save your lies now. Please leave. I won't hit you like I hit Jerry. But if you don't leave on your own, I'll pick you up and carry you off my property. I warned you, do that, and I'll file assault charges against you. You can call the police and have them evict me from your property. But if you touch me without my permission, I'll burn you, she threatened. I locked eyes with her and held my gaze as I took out my cell phone. So be it, I said as I started pushing buttons on the phone. What are you doing? She asked nervously. Taking your advice and calling the cops, I replied. Damn it, Rob, why won't you be reasonable and hear me out? She pleaded. Because I don't want to. All right, all right, I'll go, she relented. She turned and walked around the side of the house and out the gate. I disconnected the call and went back to scoping out the yard. For the following two days, I avoided answering Maggie's calls, whether they came through my work phone, home phone, or cell. Evenings were dedicated to working on home improvement projects listed for preparing the house for sale. While fixing a leaking shower door in the downstairs bathroom, a loud noise from the kitchen caught my attention. Upon investigating, I discovered Maggie entering through a broken window. What are you doing here, getting into my house since my key is no longer valid? That's the way I chose to do it, she said. You're not supposed to be here. This is my home as much as it is yours. Simply claiming I don't live here anymore doesn't change that. You should have hired a better lawyer. Rob, your divorce papers don't specify who gets the primary residence pending the court's decision. I've corrected that in my petition. Once you're served, you'll have to move out. Your petition. I'm countersuing on what grounds. I demanded a no-fault case, Rob, so I don't need grounds. However, my lawyer suggested stating a reason. So I'm citing extreme mental cruelty. If there are no complications, the paperwork is rubber stamped and it's done. Explain. But it's not true, so it becomes public record. If someone does a record search, I won't come out looking good. Maggie pointed out, so fine, if that's how you want to play it. I'll consult my lawyer tomorrow and change my petition from irreconcilable differences to adultery. Let's see how you feel if your name pops up in a record search. To spice it up, I have evidence for my claim, and you don't. I threatened you. You don't have any proof. Maggie challenged, I'm well aware. I received information from a reliable source that you were unfaithful, so I installed surveillance cameras in our house before my recent business trip. I possess a vivid recording on a DVD capturing you being unfaithful in our bedroom and on our bed. I revealed, is that the reason for all this? My involvement with Chrissy and Jerry. Maggie inquired Jerry, what does Jerry have to do with any of this? Don't faint. Ignorance, Margaret Estelle. You know very well what Jerry's role is in this. The three of you have been betraying me since before we even got married. I accused. I noticed a change in her expression, as if a light bulb had suddenly lit up. Oh no, Rob, you've misunderstood. There is absolutely nothing going on between Jerry and me. There has never been anything between Jerry and me. Yes, between me and Chris, but never with Jerry. Maggie clarified. That's not the information I received. You visit Jerry and Christina every Tuesday and Thursday when you're supposed to be at card games and book club meetings. Sometimes Jerry is home, and sometimes he isn't. Even when he's home, he stays in his den or works in the basement. Jerry has never been involved in what Chris and I do. He's aware of it, of course. 
but he also knows that Chrissy loves him and won't seek another man. He allows her those little pleasures, Maggie explained. So you're admitting to cheating on me? I accused, absolutely not. Cheating implies taking something from you and giving it to someone else. But that's exactly what you were doing. No, I wasn't, Maggie denied. Did I ever refuse you when you wanted intimacy, except during my monthly cycle? No, I didn't. Even then, I always satisfied you if you desired it. Who initiated lovemaking? Half the time, I did, as our intimacy life suffered due to my time with Chris. No, it hasn't. We still make love four or five times a week. Can you point to anything over the past six years that shows I didn't love or care for you? Maggie challenged, No, you can't. Do we cuddle any less? There's nothing to indicate that I don't love you or deprive you of anything. My involvement with Chris hasn't cost you a thing. Your involvement with Christina? I interjected, I'm bisexual, Rob, and I have been since summer camp when I connected with two girls who were also. Chris was my roommate throughout college, and we recognized our shared orientation right away. We were lovers during college and beyond. It's been almost 11 years of fulfilling each other's bisexual desires. It's still cheating, and you know it. The fact that you've lied to me for six years about your activities on Tuesdays, Thursdays, some Saturdays, and when I'm away proves that you know it's wrong. Maggie countered, no, it doesn't. It just proves that I love you too much to let you know, because I knew how you'd react, knowing it would likely have driven us apart. Of course, knowing you were cheating would break us apart. Damn it, Rob, I wasn't cheating. I didn't tell you because of the thoughts in your head right now. You've made countless derogatory remarks about people who aren't straight. If I told you I was bisexual, you would have assumed I was different, or used some other offensive term for people who don't see intimacy the way you do. I never let you know because I needed what I get from Chris that I can't get from you. So, you're saying I don't satisfy you in bed? No, damn it, that's not what I'm saying. I'm extremely satisfied with you in bed, but you don't have the physical aspects I need. You're not a woman, Rob, and I occasionally need that. I need you, and I need what I get from Chris. It means both. Rob, I need a man, and that's you. And I need a woman, and that's Christina. I need both of you. There was a brief pause, and then Maggie broke the silence, asking, What's the next step, Rob? Should we contact the lawyers and ask them to nullify the paperwork? Do we move past this and focus on our marriage? I'm not sure if that's even possible. Maggie, you've shattered my trust. How do I know that Christina is the only one you've been unfaithful with? Can I be certain there isn't another man in the picture? Can I trust your claim that you had nothing to do with Jerry? All I have is your word, but what is the value of that word? You've proven to be an adept liar for six years without me suspecting a thing. Even if you're telling the truth, you are still unfaithful. Call it what you want, Maggie. But to me, it's still infidelity. Any form of intimate relationship with someone other than your spouse is cheating. Can I move past it, perhaps with effort? But can you? Can you with your bisexual nature? But just having only half of what you claim to need... Can you let go of Christina and find contentment with just me? I questioned. I'm not letting go of Christina, Rob. Maggie stated firmly. Well, there's your answer. I replied. What answer? Maggie asked, puzzled. You asked if we should contact the lawyer, serve, and void the paperwork, and you just answered that question. The answer is no. We won't call them. I clarified. I never made that statement. Maggie protested. Yes, you did. When I asked if you could prioritize our relationship over Christina, you chose her. I explained, come on, Rob, be reasonable. I explained my perspective to you. Maggie pleaded. You explained it from your point of view, and as far as you're concerned, it's not an issue, but from my standpoint, it is a problem. I won't share my partner with anyone be it a man or a woman. 
If my partner engages in intimate relations with someone else, it's considered cheating, and I won't accept it. I asserted, are you serious? Are you willing to end what we've had over this? Maggie asked incredulously, okay, Rob, I'll let go of Chris. Are you satisfied now? No, Maggie, it's too late for that. I replied, why? I'm giving you what you want, Maggie said confusedly. Yes, but you're doing it reluctantly. You don't really want to. And as far as you're concerned, I'm forcing you. You resent it, and over time, that resentment will build and further affect our relationship. You still don't acknowledge that you've done anything wrong, and if the opportunity arises where you think you can do it without consequence, you will. Our only chance was when I asked if you could be content with just me, and you replied definitively, I'm not giving up Christina, Rob. That sealed the fate of our relationship. I explained, no, Maggie, the only way our marriage could have continued was if I never found out. Unfortunately, I did. Enjoy Christina and find a man who can accept it. Just make sure you're honest with him before you marry him. I concluded, Maggie never pursued a countersuit, and the divorce was finalized. It was painful because I genuinely loved Maggie, and that feeling may endure. But I couldn't bring myself to accept infidelity, even if she didn't believe she was cheating. I suppose adhering to old-fashioned values comes with a price. Maggie remarried, but I have no knowledge of whether she disclosed her inclinations to her new spouse before they exchanged vows. What I do know is that she lived in Jerry and Christina's spare bedroom until she moved out again. The rift between my brother and me never healed. Maggie's statement that he never laid a hand on her meant nothing to me because he was aware of her actions, kept it for me, and covered for her, which in my view was just as egregious. While I reached a point where I could attend family gatherings with him and Christina present, I maintained my distance, and we never exchanged words despite Christina's attempts to bridge the gap. I eventually met a woman I liked enough to date consistently, and after six months, she hinted at wanting a long-term commitment before tying the knot. I asked if she had any secrets I should be aware of. When she inquired about the nature of secrets, I shared my history with Maggie. She chuckled and said, I've had a few experiences, but I'm not particularly into them. I much prefer fidelity, and I'm a strong believer in it. I married Betty, and things are going well. In fact, she's expecting, and I'll be a father in six months. This story makes you think about the complexity of interpersonal relationships, how we perceive betrayals, and how we react to them. It also demonstrates that decision-making can sometimes be a difficult and painful process, but ultimately, it can lead to a new beginning in a better life. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.